Anyone, good evening and welcome to CHM, the Computer History Museum. Uh, as you all know, CHM is the leading institution chronicling the history and impact of computing technologies. Over the last four decades, we've built the world's foremost collection and exhibitions to tell the story of the digital revolution, from the people to the companies to the inventions that have changed the world. And our new mission spans the computing past and the digital present with implications on the future impact of technology on the human condition. And with this in mind, CHM could also represent computing, humanity, and meaning. And the question in the lens by which we've been operating the museum for the last few years is this question, and that is, what does it mean to be human in a world that does not exist without computing? Given that we all live in this transformational era, an era when computing is both ubiquitous and ambient, it's ever-present, and because computing touches all of our lives, we're all part of the story. And the decisions that we each make every day about our technology, how we use it, what we interact with, will determine the direction of our lives tomorrow. And as we're all digital citizens, we can make a difference in how technology can shape a better future for ourselves, our communities, and the planet. As we expand our community that encompasses both the tech pioneers and today's innovators, business and government leaders, thought leaders, and academics, educators and students, with strong partners and our new engaged digital citizen communities outside of these walls, we are committed to including and highlighting a new and diverse array of voices. We're convening critical conversations about the promise, the possibilities, and the perils of technology affecting the economic and social changes on a global scale. And we're investing in partnering with leading firms to apply state-of-the-art technologies to the creation of a 21st century museum. I like to say, if not us, who? Uh, so we're just talking a little bit at our table over dinner about this. We are investing very heavily in the future implications of computing and how we will reach audiences around the world in their language, in real time, with dynamic physical programming in the museum, as well as digital programming that can be represented anywhere on the planet. And here's a short video to introduce some of the ways the museum is working to curate, convene, and connect the world of tech for good. At the Computer History Museum, we believe that technology at its best can solve problems, bring people together, and build a better future. We're champions of tech for good, technology that's ethically designed and used, and that serves all of humanity. CHM highlights visionary role models. Free world-class education for anyone anywhere. That's the mission statement. I realized how desperate technologies used in hospitals here were from technologies used in hospitals in Ghana, and I wanted to kind of bridge that gap. I view myself as a human-centered designer of technology. I'm trying not just to make computing smarter or more secure, but a better fit for people's needs, goals, desires, uh, and their lives. CHM convenes thought leaders to consider critical issues. Why do we have a like button, but we don't have a truth button. The ability to let people talk directly to each other, that's been really powerful in my own creative endeavors, in writing and politics, um, and also in people's political organizing. Technology itself isn't value neutral. It involves a set of trade-offs. It generates benefits alongside costs. We have facial recognition technology that is designed not to recognize people of color or women, but more recognize you know, white men, what have we done? And I think if, if, if done right, social media, these digital, other digital tools um, are vital when it comes to improving public health. But we need to build people and processes and systems that have checks and balances. CHM shares the stories of tech for good innovators. The number of people that I could touch directly but in a matter of weeks or months, I just couldn't walk away from that. The essence of, of entrepreneurship, it's a mindset. And 
it's an inherent dissatisfaction with the status quo. We're building a global community committed to a better future. Join us. Well, thanks for taking a look at that. Over the past two years, the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation has been a partner and a supporter of a prize program focused on tech for humanity. The foundation and CHM share deep optimism that technological advances can help ensure a prosperous and sustainable future for all. We're grateful for the generous support that has made possible a class of remarkable prize recipients. And much of what we have in store for you tonight would not be possible without the foundation's generous support. So it is my pleasure at this time to introduce our partner, the CEO of the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation, just back from the World Economic Forum at Davos. He is an entrepreneur, a technologist, and a human rights advocate. Prior to joining the foundation, he founded a field-leading nonprofit incubator and a sustainable public interest law firm. He holds a JD from the NYU School of Law, a master's in public administration from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and dual bachelor degrees in biomedical engineering and computer science from the University of Illinois. Imagine that. So please join me in welcoming Malas Dar to the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wow, good evening, everyone. Um, that was quite the introduction, but let me say that in that whole list, I think, Daniel, you missed the most important thing, which is tonight, I feel like I'm a kid in a candy store. I had this incredible opportunity before we started our formal program to walk through the exhibits downstairs, to see the kind of technologies that have shaped the human experience, but in many ways have shaped my own journey. I saw some of the first computers I ever owned. I got to see some of the punch cards that I built some of my research on. Um, I almost got in trouble because I really just wanted to plug everything in and just start playing with it. I restrained myself because I'm an adult, it's okay, but I do hope, Daniel, maybe one of these days I get a behind the scenes tour and we can start playing with the Ataris. It also took me back. It wasn't just a moment of nostalgia thinking about these machines, but it made me think of a story that maybe those of you who know me closely have heard from me once or twice. When I was a kid, I grew up in a small town actually right down the road from one of the big craze, uh, from the home of Iliac. I grew up in a small town in Illinois called Champaign that was the home of the National Center for Supercomputing. And when I was a kid, I got to do something really incredible. I got to put on my blue Jansport backpack and walk down the road and actually get to participate and be a part of learning programs and eventually coding and really being a part of the National Center for Supercomputing community. I got to experience what it meant to have supercomputers, not as a policy matter, not as a macroeconomic matter, but to run through the towers and hear the fans spinning. And I'll tell you what, I would go home and I'd tell my family about this. And I often talk about my grandfather, somebody who was a real moral compass for me in my life. And my grandfather would indulge me. He'd be like, oh, this is great. I was so excited, much as I am tonight, I was inspired. And he'd listen, and he'd ask about the capabilities. He'd say, what can we use it for? And I'd tell him. And then eventually, about 10 minutes into every conversation, we got to the same point. You could tell. He'd finished indulging me. He'd finished asking questions about what it could do. And then he'd ask me a question, so what you learned today, how does it help anyone? That's what stuck with me my whole life. We, today at the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation, get to build a civil society institution that asks that question at scale. We're excited and inspired by what technology does, by the opportunity it creates for us to be not just more efficient, not just more creative, but maybe to be as human as we possibly can be, to let us connect with people all around the world, to let us explore what our imaginations allow. But underlying it is always a question, how does this help people? Building technologies without asking questions about human dignity, about participation, who creates, who makes decisions about our future, who's actually defining what the world will look like when technology drives and creates all of this opportunity. To build technology without asking human questions is fundamentally inhumane. So with that thought, I'm really excited for tonight. I'm excited to be here. I want to thank the Computer History Museum for their incredible partnership. 
and we're going to meet some incredible luminaries. We chose that name for a reason. Patrick McGovern was very fond of saying, the future is bright. In order to get there, we sometimes need torchbearers with us to take us on the journey. Some of the individuals we'll honor tonight are those torchbearers. Thank you all for this. I hope we have a really fun evening, and I can't wait to celebrate and feed our incredible luminaries tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vilas. I'd like to add my warm welcome to each of you. My name is Marguerite Gong Hancock, and I serve as the Vice President of Innovation and Programming here at the museum. As Vilas says, said, we share a deep commitment to a human-centric future that's aided by technology. And that is what has brought us here together tonight as we honor each of these prize recipients in a way that also honors the legacy of Patrick McGovern. I'd like to also give a special thanks not only to our partners at the McGovern Foundation and to our trustee champion, Lori Hart McGovern, but also to the selection committee who served during this period of time, uh, who represented uh, many different sectors. They've been remarkable in their uh, uh, impact in technology, business, media, the arts, academia, and public service. Uh, those members of the committee, some who are here in person and some who are joining us virtually, include the chair of the committee, uh, technology futurist, author, and uh, Stanford professor, Paul Sappho, social robotics innovator and MIT professor, Cynthia Brazil, historian and museum software curator, David C. Brock, Pixar co-founder and Oscar winner, Ed Catmull, media executive and DLD conference founder, Steffi Cerny, Tech media pioneer and health advocate, Esther Dyson. Co-founder and board member of the McGovern Institute at Brain Research at MIT, Lori Hart McGovern. Trustee and board chair of the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation, Patrick McGovern. Ethernet co-inventor and entrepreneur, Bob Metcalf. China venture finance pioneer and founding uh, chair of IDG Capital, Hugo Shang. I also join them with my background as a political economist and technology uh, advisor. With this committee, had a difficult challenge. We had applications from more than 80 countries, but two change makers were selected and nominations were made. Uh, each of the change maker recipients who you'll meet tonight received $50,000 to, to support their specific projects and offered an optional residency at CHM, special access to our collection participation in the museum community, uh, plus an opportunity to talk about their work at a museum seminar and a public education event earlier this year. Our luminary and change makers were interviewed by our media team and curators, um, which has given fruit to new digital stories and short documentaries to tell about their work. What were the key ideas that were animating them? How are they using technology to serve humanity? These are now all part of our collection, accessible for all, for free, and used for education content to, we hope, inspire the next generation. All of this, combined with tonight's event, are part of the museum's ongoing commitment as curator, as convener, as connector to accelerate the work and impact of tech change makers, shine the light on visionary role models, build a diverse community of people around the globe committing, committed to tech for humanity, and inspire the next generation of innovators and change makers. Look around the room. There are people with diverse backgrounds and working in many different fields and many ages. I'm thrilled that Saul has brought his children here and there are other people of uh, many ages who are here who are gonna make change now and in the future. So with this shared vision, it's been wonderful to work closely with members of the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation, including Pat McGovern. I'm now going to introduce him to share some remarks. He is, as I said before, the chair of the Board of Trustees of the Foundation, a longtime tech executive. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Pat McGovern. Well, good evening. It's great to see everyone here. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here this evening and um, to welcome the first Tech for Humanity winner, <clears throat> Saul Khan. Saul is a visionary leader and a voice for equitable opportunity in the world. He, of course, is the founder of the Khan Academy, a nonprofit 
with a mission of providing free, world-class education for anyone, anywhere. This award is very special for us at the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation, and it's very dear to me. This award is in the memory of my father, Patrick McGovern, a tech industry pioneer, a visionary businessman, and a dedicated humanitarian. From his earliest days, Pat McGovern was a change maker, and over the span of his career, he helped define an entire era of technology advancement. When my father was a college student at MIT in the 1950s, he had the foresight to understand that computers were going to change the world in ways that we couldn't imagine. He recognized that consumers, business leaders, and technologists would be hungry for reliable data, information, and analysis on this emerging tech sector. So combining his um, technology expertise, creative talents, and business acumen, he founded IDG, International Data Group, a global technology publishing company. He was only 27 years old at the time when he, he actually founded it. What emerged from this start was a new sector of a, a type of business, computer tech publishing. Within a few years, he launched titles such as Computer World, Mac World, Info World, PC World, as well as the well-known Dummies books. Over time, IDG grew and grew to 90 countries, 300 print publications, 450 websites, and 750 annual events. As remarkable as my father's accomplishments were, so too was his incredible optimism, charisma, and generosity. My father cared about people, and it showed in how he ran his company, but also how he gave back to the world. During his lifetime, he and his wife, Lori McGovern, championed the advancement of neuroscientific research to understand the brain and apply that knowledge to help people with brain disorders. He also supported many organizations that help uh, people learn about science. In fact, in, well, including the Computer History Museum. He was an original member of the Computer History Museum board, alongside museum co-founders Gordon and Gwen Bell, and IT pioneers such as Bob Noyce, co-founder of Intel. Throughout his career, my father found ways to support the work of exceptional individuals. He believed people, not institutions, can change the world. It is in this spirit of optimism and belief that technology can be a force for good that we celebrate today. The Tech for Humanity Award was created to honor the legacy of uplifting those whose talent and passion are advancing technology in service to humanity. You know, I, I know my father would be thrilled to have Saul Khan as the winner of the CHM Patrick J. McGovern Tech for Humanity Award. Saul continues to inspire us with his lifetime of innovation and global impact. Saul has done an amazing job educating students and adults. Some of them are here today, I'm sure. The Khan Academy has 130 million registered users in 190 countries teaching math and science in 51 different languages. 51, think about that, 51 different languages. And think about an impact of a man who's affected the lives of 190, 130 million people. We are so proud to celebrate Saul today. I'm gonna go off script for just a second. Um, my, uh, I have twins, my wife and I have twins, and um, we were dressed up and the kids were like, where are you going today? And this is complete truth, because uh, I'm not always wearing a suit. I said, oh, we're going to the Computer History Museum. And they're like, oh, great, you know, they've been here before and they love the place. And, um, and I said, yeah, we're gonna be celebrating uh, Saul Khan from the Khan Academy. And my son said, the Khan Academy? Wait a minute, you have to thank him. He, he allowed me to pass so many classes. That, seriously, thank him, because it's, it's amazing. And that, and that is, honest to God, exactly what he said. Um, and he was very, very moved, so it's very good. As Marguerite said, we are also thrilled to honor two Changemaker recipients. As a member of the award judging committee, I can tell you we had a huge inflow of amazing applicants, each of them doing amazing work. Please join me in congratulating Mercy Niamwa Asidu 
and Michael Bernstein for the respective work using technology to improve uh, health equity and social justice. Thank you, Saul. Thank you, Mercy. Thank you, Michael. And thanks to all of you for all that you uh, um, have done and all that you will do to create a thriving, equitable, and sustainable future for all. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Pat McGovern touched so many lives, and so it's a great honor to be doing this in his legacy. I was one of those people that was personally affected by him as a young PhD student trying to write a, a dissertation about the computer industry in China. I found my way to IDG, and uh, I was using those early documents. And I know that story has been told by countless, really millions of others who have used um, so much of that knowledge. Uh, so as we continue, it is now time to celebrate our two change makers. And here to talk about the Change Maker Prize and to introduce that portion of the program is the chair of the selection committee, Paul Sappho. Thank you, Marguerite. It is wonderful to be here, and I want to make it clear. My role here is uh, representing the, uh, the judging committee. Um, and I, just to give context, I will read the brief that we gave to the committee. And it went, the, the Patrick J. McGovern Prize at CHM recognizes innovative luminaries and global change makers who are harnessing information technology to shape a better future for humanity. Prize recipients strive to meet the grand challenges of our digital age, including how to use technology to address the world's most urgent challenges, how to ethically develop and apply technology for the greater good, and how to understand what it means to be human in a digital world. I um, mentioned the brief in no small part because this was the first year of the prize. And this was a very heavy lift by a very distinguished committee. Um, Patrick was, was of course, a, an anchor on that committee. But I, uh, what do you think? How many hours do our individual committee make? It was easily a 30 to 40 hour commitment. Um, and it was just so hard to, to pick the, the finalists and the winner and I should add, part of the reason was, and this is amazing, so who here has ever been on a judging committee before? Yeah, you know what it's like. It's, it's, it's a challenge. Imagine the first year. Usually in the first year, the challenge is getting um, the right set of nominees. We had an extraordinary benefit of riches that we had 80 applicants, any one of which, honestly, well, maybe one, maybe not, uh, but 79 could easily have won this prize. They represented, 78% uh, of them were United States, 22% were international from 13 countries, representing 39% nonprofits, 21% academia, and 14% other. It was an extraordinary group. And by the way, I should mention that, you know, I, I thank all of the finalists in this. And Alexandra, where are you? Would you just stand up and wave? We have representing all the finalists, Alexander Gokar. And, and thank you again to you, Volus, for setting this whole thing up in the context. And, um, and, and of course, our, the winner who I'm about to, one of the two change makers I'm about to give the award to, Mercy, is here. But I also want to recognize her husband, Jonah, and your son, Eton, is assumedly is off having fun somewhere. He's 10 months old, so they just left him at Fry. Oh, wait, Fry's closed. That's right. Um, and, and I should also, as long as I was saying thanks, where's Connie Martinez? Unable to come. Well, we'll thank her in her absence. Uh, all of you who enjoyed the dinner and the ambiance here, she played an absolutely crucial role on that. So um, what I would like to do before we uh, give the first Changemaker Prize, I believe we have a video we can screen. The name of my first change maker project is developing readily accessible technologies for cervical cancer screening in global women's health. 
in a lot of developed countries, um, cervical cancer is almost non-existent, and more than 90% of deaths related to cancer in developing countries. So the first thing that I was working with the lab to solve was the expensive diagnostic tools, which were not readily available in resource-limited settings. I have two devices here, um, the Coloscope and Pocket Corposcope. And these really small portable devices are meant to replace a standard corposcope, which you know can be pretty bulky, um, analog. Um, the provider looks true to see a magnified view of the cervix, but it's not very portable. Typically requires um, constant supply of electricity, which might not always be available, and can be quite expensive. So we've made these portable versions. My second change maker project is um, developing a telehealth plus patient-centered electronic medical record system um, for primarily targeting um, Sub-Saharan Africa. And the problem it was designed to address was um, access to specialist providers, specifically in chronic um, disease management, but also um, access to read, ready access to health records and data um, for personalized AI-based recommendations. There isn't a lot of data to understand trends of some of these chronic diseases um, in sub-Saharan Africa. So the best way to get patient data is through their electronic health records. And most of those health records in a lot of smaller clinics are kept on paper. And it's really hard to access them. It's also really difficult for patients to keep track of their own medical records and see what's going on and understand what's going on. The telehealth aspect was to address that issue, to allow um, anyone to be able to reach a specialist um, for their condition at any time. And the health record aspect actually allows patients to store their health records right on their phone in the app. When they see doctors through uh, application, the doctors send visit notes directly to the phones. It helps them to provide the identified data that can be used to understand the context of chronic diseases like diabetes in the region. In the next five to 10 years, I would really love for at least one or two of the projects that I've been working on to be making a scalable impact in bridging um, health disparities um, and really making a change in people's lives um, that can be felt. So I will invite Mercy up on the stage in just a moment. Um, and of course, there's a bio in your materials. But I just hit a couple of high points here, because this is, you know, on the committee, we go, OK, let me get it straight. So she's the Schmidt Science Postdoc Fellow at MIT, but it's joint with Mass General and Harvard. She's CTO and co-founder of Cala Health uh, Foundation. And she's co-founder of Gap Health Technologies. One of our challenges as judges, we were trying to figure out what thing we were awarding her for. Because you know, in Silicon Valley, we talk about serial entrepreneurs. Well, Mercy is a parallel entrepreneur. I don't know, I don't know when she sleeps, much less you know, how, how she and her husband managed to raise a 10-month-old child and still change the world. Um, the committee could not think of anyone more qualified except uh, one equally qualified you'll hear about in a moment for us. So, Mercy, please come up here. If, if you will stand there for a moment, I have one last ritual saying, and that is on behalf of the, Patri of the Computer History Museum, Patrick J. McGovern Technology for Humanity Changemaker Prize and the committee, I give you this as a memento. Congratulations. Let's give her a hand. And now the floor is yours. So 
So thank you so much um, to everyone for being here. It's so great to be able to celebrate this in person. And I'm really grateful to the um, CHM committee for picking me as one of the two change makers from amongst such a competitive group. So thank you so much. Um, just a few months ago, I was working with a social worker on a project on how to use technology to bridge some of these racial disparities in maternal mortality. And she, from her perspective, mentioned that she was highly distrustful of technology and her patients were as well. And while I agreed with her in some sense, and there's a reason to be distrustful of technology, I also think, like a lot of you here, technology can be a great force for good. For instance, my grandmother, who recently passed away at the ripe age of 96, um, in her village in Ghana, had a very cheap Android phone with WhatsApp that she could use to communicate with her children in the cities and her grandchildren who lived outside. So technology is really um, bridging gaps in communication, can be used to bridge gaps in disparities, healthcare, but there needs to be more incentives like what CHM um, Changemaker Award provides so that people are really thoughtfully thinking of ways to use technology to do good. And so currently, uh, where are we with the projects that were just described? Um, Color Health, with the help of some of the CHM funding, um, has started shipping our first devices to customers, um, which is really great. And, and Gap Health, um, which actually got its first major source of funding from this award, um, we were able to put together a really great team based in Ghana, um, launch our application on the app store, um, the iOS and Android stores, and um, complete a pilot in a hospital in Kumasi. And we are currently working on trying to scale up and bring on customers. So, this award has gone such a long way in helping both companies um, reach their next uh, trajectories or their next steps. And I'm really excited to see where this award would help other like-minded change makers to use technology for good. So thank you so much. Mercy, I'm thrilled to be the first to congratulate you as our change maker. We're so proud of the progress that you're making and know that there's a bright road ahead of you. Congratulations. Next, we honor change maker Michael Bernstein. He's an associate professor at Stanford focused on human computer interaction. Let's watch this video to learn about his work and his change maker project. In order to achieve scale, many of these social media platforms have started relying more and more heavily on artificial intelligence to help identify what they would describe as problematic, toxic behaviors. These might range from uh, aggressive or harassing comments to spreading disinformation. Often minoritized communities are going to draw the line of what's harassment, for example, differently than someone who maybe looks like me and has been historically subjected to less of that kind of behavior. But because they're minoritized communities, they're usually smaller, and when you just take a majority vote, guess whose voice is getting erased? Minority groups. And as a result, the AIs aren't representing their perspectives. So what we actually need to start to do is train the AI to essentially be able to take on the points of view of a bunch of different people. The high level approach that we're taking is, is drawn after this metaphor of a jury. Imagine if instead of an AI simply saying this or that is the answer, the metaphor is that the AI is trying to replicate a jury of people who may have different opinions. And those, those opinions are then aggregated into a result. So what this makes us do is it makes us make explicit who's in this jury, how many people are 
represented in the jury from various different groups, different, uh, different groups you might care about or intersectional identities. So instead of simply saying, this is the correct answer, we say, well, a quarter of the jury represents people who uh, look and feel this way, a quarter of the jury are from this group, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, what the AI is going to do is select a bunch of jurors who represent these various groups at random, and then we'll predict what each of those individuals will say, and then we essentially get the jury result. What we want to try to do is catalyze a change in how these platforms build their models. So empowering either end users or the platform designers and developers themselves to really see why this is better. So one thing we're doing there is to basically take this model and instantiate in a way that's out on the public web that anyone can play with. Um, in an ideal world, what then happens is that advocates, platform developers, and so on can mess around with it and build confidence in it. Now, the second step is to actually get this to be implemented. And there's well-trodden paths for this. You know, We'll be open sourcing the code and the models in ways that other groups can essentially take it and adapt it to their own needs. So you know they're not they don't need to take our word at for it. They can actually try to to do it themselves. Our next special guest is here to present the Changemaker Prize to Michael. She's the inaugural Sequoia Professor in the Computer Science Department at Stanford and co-director of Stanford uh, Stanford's Human Centered AI Institute. Pre previously, she served as the director of Stanford's AI Lab, and during her sabbatical. She was vice president of Google and served as chief scientist of AI and machine learning at Google Cloud. Her current research interests focus around cognitively inspired AI, machine learning, deep learning, computer vision, and AI plus healthcare. She's published more than 200 scientific articles and in addition to her <coughs> excuse me, technical contributions, she's a national leading voice on advocating diversity in STEM and AI. She's co-founder and chair of the national nonprofit AI for All, aimed at increasing inclusivity, inclusion and diversity in AI education. We're thrilled you're here, Fei Fei, and uh, we're looking forward to you presenting the prize to Michael. Thank you, and uh, first of all, congratulations, uh, Mercy. This is just such an incredible uh, story. Um, I'm truly honored to be here today and to be invited to present the prestigious Patrick J. McGovern Tech for Humanity Prize to a colleague, a friend, and a technology visionary whom I have admired for a long time, Michael Bernstein. Well, you're going to work for this, so let me start with a question to all of you. Raise your hand if you use some kind of social media. Okay, I'm glad the young kids here don't have their hands up. <laughs> um, keep your hands up. If you worry about social media promoting toxicity, shutting down voices of people from diverse backgrounds, or harming people, especially those from minority groups. Okay. Honestly, I'm glad uh, you have your hands up, so thank you. Now you can put your hands down. You've done all the work. Um, I'm also relieved um, that most of you have, you know, are worried because you should be. While technologies like social media have brought many of us together, have connected people in unprecedented, unprecedented ways, and have done incredible things, they have also done harm. Creating and managing social media online is, well, hard. As the last decade has taught us, even the best intentions, uh, intentioned social systems can fall prey to misinformation, harassment, exclusion, and more. So my colleague Michael Bernstein's work asks these questions. What are we going to do about this? What are the concrete changes we can make to the platforms that will result in less antisocial behavior and stronger communities? If all technology is built in the service of humanity, then we need people who start from a vision not of how the technology works, but from what technology we need. This is Michael and his collaborator's goal. 
It is a project called Jury Learning. They wanted to address directly these important problems. For example, what does and doesn't cross the line into harassment? Typically, we would ask people and then take majority vote. But this silenced majority, uh, minority voices. Michael's project with his team builds on a machine learning architecture where we make explicit choices about whose voice we should be listening to, helping application designers to think reflectively about whose voice matters and where and how. The model that Michael and his collaborators developed can be directly integrated into machine learning pipelines in social media uh, apps. It enables us to imagine a future where product developers think, can think more explicitly out loud about whose values they're encoding into their systems. And through the work of Michael and the team, they have already done. We have evidence that this will actually lead to observable and measurable changes in the decisions that, that, that these machine learning models make in production. It is not surprising that this very new innovative work has won the best paper award at the recent ACM CHI conference last month, the flagship conference of the human computer interaction research community. In the past three years, together with colleagues like Michael Bernstein, I have been leading the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI, or Stanford High. More than 200 Stanford faculty from all disciplines work on research or education projects with the goal of endowing our technologies with human values and ensuring the practice of technology and policies are human-centered. Michael's project is one of many such work that are beginning to change the narrative of our time. More and more, especially here in the heart of Silicon Valley, we're realizing that as creators and innovators of technology, we cannot just make things. We also need to make things to do good. This is Michael's mission. It's also our shared collective mission. So together, let's welcome uh, Michael Bernstein onto stage. Thank you, Fei-Fei. When I showed up at Stanford, Fei-Fei was one of the first people who knocked on my office door and was uh, telling, welcoming me and telling me that I, I had a place here. So thank you so much for your support, Fei-Fei. And I'll, I'll see you back here when you win the Turing Award. Um, two errors, one, asking a professor to make remarks, two, asking them to do it in five minutes. So I'm a social computing designer. Uh, I'm interested in how we craft the spaces that connect us together online. And we social computing designers, we, we live in interesting times. Uh, you know, if you rewind a decade ago, when we talked about social media as the Arab Spring unfolded, social media were largely thought of as kind of heralding an advancement of democracy, of, of communities online. And in retrospect, you know, it is naive to say that we could get you know, three billion people into the same party and expect everyone to have a good time. And so today, the, the story is different. You can sort of pick your poison. There's harassment, misinformation, extremism, polarization. They're variously empowered or at least enabled by these kinds of socio-technical systems. And it's not that these issues couldn't have been foreseen, it's not that they didn't exist a decade ago, but what I'm interested in doing and what I think all of us here are trying to do is address them. What can we change? And I think we're having important and overdue conversations about regulation. And I want to focus on what we as technologists for a moment might be able to achieve. Because I think we often fall into this trap this trap of calling uh, you know, social technology as, as protocols, 
speech as a protocol, software. You know, AI just uh, it helps scale it. And protocols are, you know, instructions, they're software, they're, they're the pipes. But the tech stack of social tech is much deeper than that. You know, if you reflect on the difference between, you know, the best, uh, best group you've ever been a part of and the worst one, or the best, you know, set of friends you've ever hung out with and the, and, and, and the worst one, they're all using the same protocol, you know, speech, language, gesture, to communicate. But some are these incredible spaces of creativity and warmth, and others are like someone decided to like take middle school and like insert it into the pits of Tartarus. And that's not a matter of protocols. It's a, it's a difference between good and bad design, at least from where I stand. I think of us sort of more like architects. Like we craft spaces. Those spaces have attitudes, they have values, they have norms. And we're all of this here in like Lang Langdon Winter. They're same, same materials, different architecture, different outcome. That's why it's so interesting to be standing here at a moment when we're talking about you know, reanimating these debates of like free speech and social media. And ironically, uh, you know, incidentally, if any of you have like grant funds to the tune of 44 billion hanging out, let me know. Um, because if, if I'm an architect of online spaces, being hands off is sort of like designing every space essentially identically, regardless of whether it's a space for fun, for discussion, for collaboration. We never do this in other contexts. It would be like building a party hall, but refusing to put any furniture in. It'd be like building a concert hall, but like uh, not having an orchestra pit. It's not good, and it's not even neutral. A large public square in principle lets everyone speak, but the well-run public squares are purposefully well-designed for that purpose. They work not just to privilege the loud voices. So rather than hiding behind the sort of supposedly neutral spaces we might create, our goal in this project is to make our values explicit. Whose voices are we empowering and how? It's the, the, the animus, the animating motivation of the project. That we have this opportunity to make our voices explicit and our values explicit through whose voices we're prioritizing in the AIs that we create. And as these systems are built into more and more of the systems we see online, we, can make, we need to make these decisions purposefully. And our hope is that this project provides an, a, a tool for doing so. So I, I need to pause for a moment and close by pointing to my PhD student, Mitchell Gordon, who really led this work from top to bottom. So please. He'll be on the academic job market next year, uh, so I hope that you'll consider this my letter of recommendation. Uh, and to my faculty colleagues, uh, Tatsu Hashimoto in machine learning, Jeff Hancock in communication, Kara Patel at Apple Research, and a couple of other Stanford PhD students who also collaborated on this project, Michelle Lam, Jun Sung Park. And thanks, uh, as, as Mercy says, thank you so much to the McGovern Foundation, the Award Com Committee, Computer History Museum. Really such an honor. Thank you again. Wonderful to hear from Michael's own view about the key questions and animating ideas that have, have um, given fruit to this work. Thank you, and congratulations, Michael. Well, to close this changemaker portion of the evening, we present a performing artist. Like Mercy, he was born in Ghana. In 1977, Paul Sion Flynn Aka was named best vocalist in Ghana's version of the Grammys. Uh, the other musicians respected him so much, they dubbed the young star Pope, and that name has stuck uh, as he came to the US in the 1980s. Come join me on stage here, Pope. He first came as a cultural ambassador to teach African music to inner city children in a music exchange program. His Sweet Talks band has performed across Europe, Asia, South America, and Africa. And in his work on human rights, uh, he performs annually with the UN on Peace Day and Human Rights Day. He's an adjunct professor at St. Mary's College, an active composer, performer, and educator on African drumming and dance. Here is master drummer, Pope Flynn.
Iakutu Iakutu za Iakutu Iakutu za Iakutu Mama na Iakutuza, mama na niye. Iakutu, mama na niyo. Iakutuza, mama na niye. Iakutuza, iakutu, iakutuza, mama. Iakutu. Iakutuza, 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 Mama, Iakutu, Iakutu, Iakutuza, Iakutu, Iakutuza, Iakutu, Mama na nyuma, Iakutu. Mama na niye, iya kutu, iya kutu, iya kutu za mama, iya kutu, iya kutu za, iya kutu za, iya kutu za mama, iya kutu, iya kutu za, iya kutu, iya kutu za mama.
Oh my. Oh my. Oh my. Oh my. Wow, thank you, thank you, Pope. That's um, universal, truly universal. Um, we talk about computer languages. That one carries far and wide. That was fantastic. Um, what artistry, energy, um, and uh, ability to share. Thank you so much. Next, uh, I have the pleasure uh, of kicking off the luminary portion of our Patrick J. McGovern Tech for Humanity Prize ceremony. Core to this effort has been Lori Hart McGovern. She was mentioned earlier by Pat. She's an entrepreneur, an investor, and Lori has founded or led companies in diverse fields across healthcare, education, publishing, and high tech. In fact, she was the co-founder of Vector Graphics, a company that is included in one of the key exhibits of the museum downstairs. She's now a dynamic and, and very active board member at the museum. She's provided me with great support and sharing, uh, introducing me to people in the museum field and other areas where she has extensive experience, which is very helpful to my learning and taking on this role at the museum four years ago. Uh, she has been a terrific partner uh, to me and to the museum and her role, excuse me, and her role as a board member. She was also a terrific partner alongside of Pat McGovern. And she helped him over time lead the growth of IDG and the impact they've had around the world. And together they co-founded the McGovern Institute for Brain Research at MIT, which is a very, very important and world-class institution. And she is the ideal person to introduce the visionary and spirit of the Luminary Prize. However, she, among many others, has uh, contracted COVID, so she will not be here tonight. So with that, I'm, I'm um, pleased to ask Marguerite to come on stage and deliver Lori's remarks on her behalf. So again, Marguerite, if you would be so kind. Thank you. Uh, Lori specifically asked me to read her remarks as she has written them, and here they are. What a wonderful evening, thanks to our honored guests, luminary, change makers, and everyone else who made this event so magical. I feel honored to have been asked to say a few words about the Luminary Award, the highest honor of the CHM Patrick J. McGovern Tech for Humanity Prize, one that so reflects the values Pat cherished and lived by. I really can't separate the prize from the man. I was married to Pat for 32 years and observed very closely how he saw the future impact of technology. His mission was to educate and share knowledge of innovation, and he saw computers and technology as amplifiers of the mind and as tools that had the potential to equalize the lives of people. His company spanned the globe. The managers were local people working in their native languages within their own cultural idiosyncrasies and traditions. We were treated to cobra blood in Vietnam, deep fried scorpion in China, pickled yak tongue in Tibet, and we felt included and enriched. Pat's fundamental belief was that people were good, smart, capable, and eager to actualize their dreams, and applied technology to be one of the drivers. He truly was one of the most empowering people I have ever known. IDG's international managers meetings, where with over 100 countries represented, felt like the United Nations an unofficial powerhouse of diplomacy. Everyone working toward a common goal, one that was to inform and educate as many people as possible about tech for humanity. Sanan Arola wrote in his book, The Hype Machine, quote, if we use technology in positive and egalitarian ways, we can promote social, positive social change and can create substantial economic value. That was Pat's enduring vision. Tonight, we are here to honor the Luminary with the Luminary Award for its contribution to positive social change. We are celebrating at CHM, a museum that is not only the repository, but also the gatekeeper of our computer and technology history, a place that analyzes the past, informs, and directly and indirectly helps educate future generations. And befittingly, Pat was involved in the museum at its inception in Boston. 
the Patrick J. McGovern Tech for Humanity Prize simply belongs here. The prize is born of an idea that was enthusiastically embraced. The process for the establishment of the Luminary Award was rigorous and spearheaded by Marguerite Gong Hancock and the McGovern Foundation until all criteria were well established and aligned with what Pat McGovern stood for. The potential recipient of the Luminary Award needed to exhibit that the focus of his or her work met the challenge of our digital age, challenges of our digital age. That the technology was ethically developed and could be applied to the greater good of all in diversity, inclusion, equity, and access for an integral part that the potential recipient understood what it meant to be human in a digital world. Tonight, CHM and the McGovern Foundation celebrate Luminary SolCon. Bravo. We all know that we can't escape the ever-increasing aspect of technology in all facets of our lives. But together, we can and must try to continue the path Pat McGovern envisioned. Tech for good, tech for humanity. And that is what tonight is all about. Thank you. In 2004, Saul Khan was working at a small hedge fund in Boston when he learned that his 12-year-old cousin Nadia was having trouble in math. She said, yeah, I'm just not good at math, was her own self-perception. She'd taken a placement test the previous year. It had put her into a slower math track. So I told Nadia, I am 100% sure you are capable of understanding math. And so I offered to tutor her every day after work for me, after school for her, half an hour, 45 minutes. Slowly but surely, frankly, I had to deprogram her lack of self-confidence. Then she got caught up with her class. The same Nadia, who uh, only a few months ago was put into a slow math track, was now put into an advanced math track. Soon, Saul was tutoring cousins and family friends across the country. He noticed a pattern. They had gaps in their knowledge. The first time that they learned it, they just never mastered it. Or in some cases, you master it for the test, and then you forget it, and it atrophies. And now all of a sudden, you have to apply the same skills in the algebra. It's very difficult. Maybe software could play a role here. I started writing a little tool that would generate questions in these areas that I saw a lot of my cousins were having gaps and give them instant feedback. It would let me, as their tutor, know what they were getting wrong or right, how long it was taking them, when they were doing it. And that, I called it Khan Academy. If this could help the 15 cousins and family friends, why couldn't it one day help 15 million people? Or why couldn't it help a billion people? A little bit grandiose at the time. What if we can start to think about new in, a new type of institution that could e exist virtually and that could reach people all over the world? And so that's where, with Khan Academy, I said, I, don't, I, just, I never want anyone to question the motives here. So let's, and I never want it to lose focus on this mission of free world-class education for anyone anywhere. In 2006, a friend of Sal's suggested he scale his lessons by making videos and posting them on YouTube. Hydrogen would contribute an electron to one of these pairs. Which My cousins famously told me they like me better on YouTube than in person, uh, which I, I took as positive feedback. Uh, but then clearly a lot of other people started watching. And so uh, this was a central idea of Khan Academy. In some ways, yes, on-demand videos, that is a form of personalization. You can watch what you need at any time. It doesn't have to be a 60-minute lecture. It could be a five-minute explanation, intervention, pause, repeat, but even more, if you're able to get exercises and based on how you perform on that exercise and you get immediate feedback and then you can try something more difficult or then you can realize, wait, I think I have gaps here. I need to work on that. And so now if I'm a, if I'm a teacher, I can have all the students learn at their own time and pace on a platform like Khan Academy, get more data in real time than teachers have ever had access to and then say, look, these five kids are struggling. Even though they've had the videos, the hints, the feedback, the exercises, they need more help. So let me now sit with these five kids and do a much more focused intervention. By 2009, 50 to 100,000 people were using Khan Academy every month. It just felt like if I was able to put all of my energies into this, this could be something that could reach a lot of folks. And so that's when in 2009, I, I quit my day job took the plunge. It was hard for it to fit in a pattern that people recognized. It was a tech thing, but it was a not-for-profit. It has this big mission. And so I think that created a lot of dissonance in a lot of early philanthropist minds. Just when things were getting darkest by mid-2010, all of a sudden we started to see a light at the end of the tunnel. Some major philanthropists really stepped up. And then all of a sudden a $10,000 donation came in. And I immediately see who it is. Her name is Ann Doer. I immediately email Ann. I say, thank you so much for this incredibly generous donation. This is the largest donation that Khan Academy has ever received. 
If we were a physical school, you would now have a building named after you. And Anne immediately responds back. And she's like, I see that you're local. Uh, I'd love to buy you lunch sometime. And Anne asks me over lunch, uh, you know, so what's, your, what's your goal here? And I told her, free world-class education for anyone anywhere. That's the mission statement. And Anne said, well, you're making a surprising amount of progress. I only have quite one question. How are you supporting yourself? And in as proud of a way as possible, I said, I'm not. I drive home to my house in Mountain View about 10, 15 minutes away. And while I'm driving into my driveway, I get a text message from Ann. And it says, you really need to be supporting yourself. I've just wired you $100,000. And so you can imagine, that was a good day, just a little bit. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and obviously the money mattered because uh, it allowed me to say, hey, wow, I, I could now take a salary, at least enough to support my expenses. In July of 2010, Bill Gates praised Khan Academy in an interview at the Aspen Ideas Festival. My favorite vignette is that guy, uh, Salman Khan. He was a hedge fund guy uh, making lots of money, and he quit to do these little web videos. And, like, I'm watching this, and, and I'm like, is this really happening? Is this, like, when am I going to wake up? I was shaking. I was like, and I remember showing it that night at dinner. I showed it to my wife. I was like, what do I do now? Do I call him? Where's his number? Like, I'm assuming he's not listed. Like, how do I? And two weeks later, I get a, uh, my cell phone rings. I see it's a Seattle number. Hello? Hi, this is Larry Cohen. I'm Bill Gates' chief of staff. You might have heard that, that Bill's a fan. Yeah, I heard that. And if you're free over the next few weeks, we'd love to fly up to Seattle and learn more about what you're doing and maybe ways that we can partner. Uh, so I went up there, and uh, the meeting was eerily similar to the meeting with Anne. And that happened coincident with folks from Google reaching out. It turns out they too were using Khan Academy. Now Google and the Gates Foundation had each given almost $2 million each uh, to let Khan Academy scale. We got office space not too far from the Computer History Museum here on Castro Street uh, to, to start making it a real institution. Today, Khan Academy has 139 million registered users and reaches learners in 190 countries and 51 languages. Saul has also founded Khan Lab School and Schoolhouse.World a peer-to-peer -peer tutoring platform. But if I were to ask any of us, uh, what percent of the population do you think is capable of quantum computing research? <laughs> what percent of the population is capable of starting the next Google or writing the next great novel or writing a screenplay? Most people would say, well, right now, that's like sub 1%, maybe 10%, 20% with a great education system. But my biggest surprise, I see year after year, people that have all been written off or actually have been written off if they're allowed the opportunity the incentive to fill in their gaps, to master concepts, prove what they know, they can, they can do all of the above. We've heard from Saul, and now we're gonna hear from three people with stories and tributes about his impact. To shine the light first on the remarkable impact of Saul, we start with tech leader and philanthropist Bill Gates. He needs really no introduction. Uh, but uh, one particular connection is that he was not only an early supporter of Khan Academy, but he now serves as the, on the Global Advisory Board. Like many of us, he recently also was affected by COVID, yet he still created this special message in honor of Saul tonight. Hello, everyone, and congratulations, Saul, on receiving the Luminary Award. We've been working together for over 10 years and it's amazing what you've achieved with Khan Academy. You and your team have pioneered new ways to use technology to help students learn math and science. I still remember uh, watching those early lectures and thinking, wow, uh, I'm learning a lot here. I wish every uh, student had access uh, to, to these capabilities. You've done a great job focusing on scaling up and of course getting to the the students who are the least motivated. Your team is super creative, you know, constantly learning. Uh, where is it working? Where is it not? And I hope uh, more and more people follow your example. As we improve education, uh, there's nothing more important getting at the incredible human resources we have. Congratulations, all. Uh, thank you for your leadership and your partnership. And I'm excited for our ongoing work to get to every student. Next, we're honored to have two people who have flown to the Bay Area to tell their personal stories. 
that witness of the transformative impact of Saul and Khan Academy in their lives. First, hear from Boston. Born and raised in the Taliban heartland of southern Afghanistan, our next featured speaker as a young girl was threatened if she did not withdraw from school. So with the help of her family and the power of a connection to the internet, she ed educated herself within the high walls of her family compound through Khan Academy. This is Sultana. Join me in giving her a warm welcome. Good evening. For those of you watching me online, I apologize you cannot see me. That's because to protect my family and friends back home. So my name is Sultana. I grew up in Afghanistan. And when I was in fifth grade, I stopped going to school because it was too dangerous for me. I think back sometimes, what if I did not stumble upon Khan Academy? What would be the future of that curious but uneducated Sultana. I create different paths for her, but every time the path uh, meets a gloomy ending. In 2012, uh, I was learning English, and my brother brought me Time Magazine. Um, it was the issue of 100 people, 100 most influential people in the world. As I was flipping through the um, pages, I came across this, uh, uh, this piece written by Bill Gates about Sal Khan and this famous statement, as you already heard, the free education for anywhere, anywhere in the world. And it immediately caught my eyes, and I went uh, to my laptop and opened Khan Academy. The first video I saw was the beauty of algebra. And I knew from my family that algebra was very hard. So I really got disappointed thinking that Khan Academy is for people more advanced. At that time, I did not even know how to add and subtract. So I went back and don't know watching TV or, uh, or like helping in the kitchen. So after a few days, I, I thought about it. OK, I should try again. Maybe there is something for me. So I went asking my brother, what comes after addition and subtraction? Because I was too, uh, it might be like, I, I didn't want to tell her that I'm so ignorant that I don't, I don't even know how to add and subtract. So he told me it's fraction. And I went search on Khan Academy, and I found fraction. And I learned it. And, um, and I was really surprised. And I learned for, I went back, of course, to learn addition and subtraction. And I was learning it. I, I found math very easy. And I thought about it. Maybe it's, there's something wrong with Khan Academy. Why is it so easy if everyone was saying it's so hard? And, but then I, uh, uh, like, you know, my cousins in abroad, so, like, I would uh, like, talk to them. And, and then I found out there are things that I knew that they did not even know, like you know, decimal points, um, division, things like that. So. I know I felt like, yeah, OK, this is the right thing. So I continued learning. I started learning um, chemistry, biology, physics. Like, I wanted to learn everything. Um, so in 2015, I decided that I wanted to take my education beyond uh, what I was learning through screen. I wanted to go and study, um, like go to university. And so I, like, I decided to take the SAT. And it was not available in Afghanistan, so I had to go to Pakistan, and my, luckily my uncle was going there, so I took the loan in. Um, but when I went there, there was uh, no spot for me, so I had to wait like for two months to um, take the SAT. Luckily, I passed it and applied for university and came back to Afghanistan and uh, accepted to some universities and um, um, applied for a uh, US visa. And so I, when I went to the, uh, the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, um, after like in a minute, in less than like two minutes, my visa was rejected because the officer thought that I might not be going all the way to the U.S. just to study. It was just uh, an excuse to immigrate. Um, but on the, over those past months, I was also able to connect to um, the, the authors that I was reading. Um, in the U.S. and to those connections, I 
got connected to Nick Kristof, and uh, he wrote a powerful profile about me and suddenly getting um, uh, an entry visa to the US was easy and I was able to come. And it's been six years since I'm in the US and um, uh, now currently I'm at Tufts University doing research in developing quantum algorithms to simulate quantum chemistry. And um, yeah, so it's like uh, the humble journey that started with addition and subtraction and that which led to now doing quantum research. I cannot believe that something like Khan Academy exists. So thank you, Sal. Thank you, Sultana, for sharing your story. Your fearless pursuit of learning and new knowledge is inspiring. Next, a world-class education for anyone, anywhere. Yes, there's another story. So let's hear how another person uh, was affected when Khan Academy reached him in an unlikely place. In 2003, he was given a 30-year prison sentence for dealing cannabis. Once in prison, he decided an important step forward would be to gain an education. During a call with his mother, he expressed his new hope, and she found a Khan Academy transcript online and sent him a printed copy. That began more than a decade of learning through Khan Academy while incarcerated. In 2017, he used Khan Academy's SAT prep and was accepted into Stanford University where he'll graduate next week with a computer uh, science degree. Join me in welcoming now Jason Spires. First, it's unfair I have to speak after Sultana. Like, that's just not fair. So, when I was 19, I was arrested and I was given a 30-year sentence. And when I tell most people it was for selling nonviolent cannabis, they usually don't believe me. And I don't blame them, because there's times that it's hard for me to even believe, and I lived through it. But there were many moments in prison that I found that were hard to believe. Like the day I found out in Illinois, there's a weird loophole that a nonviolent cannabis offense can get you declared legally unrehabilitatable and more heinous than a second-degree murderer. Some positive things that happened that changed the way that I looked at everything, the way I looked at my life, the way I looked at the way that I related to society. And I knew that I needed to make amends. I needed to pay back for the harm that I caused our society. At that moment, I didn't know how I was going to do it. But I knew improving my education would help me figure that out. So I tried to sign up for school. A week later, I still remember my prison counselor telling me, oh, you can't go to school. See, they prioritized the seats for those that were rehabilitatable. And since I wasn't rehabilitatable due to that Illinois loophole rule, I couldn't go to school. So in a way, according to them, I was unteachable. But luckily, my father disagreed, and my mother disagreed. And my mother went online, and she found Khan Academy. And she found a transcript, I'm not even sure how, of one of his videos. And it was filled with all kinds of lame, cheesy jokes. But, <laughs> but as I read that transcript, it caused an epiphany to go off in my head. And that epiphany is, wow, there's people out there actually learning without a teacher standing over their shoulder telling them everything they got to do, or without even having a classroom. And that's when I went, hmm, I don't have a classroom. They told me I couldn't go to school. They didn't say I couldn't learn. And that sent me on a years-long path where I was dismantling textbooks, because he made me realize that you don't need to depend on a physical teacher standing next to you in order to learn something. 
and I studied ferociously, preparing for the day that I would get out so I could prove that I was not unrehabilitatable and unteachable. The day I got out, I used Khan Academy's SAT prep, and I got into Illinois Community College, where I successfully fought, give myself a pat on the back, to change some of the Illinois prison policies that affected me. And I was the first ever incarcerated student accepted into Phi Theta Kappa, and now other incarcerated students can be in it. And then, on June 7, 2018, I cried because I was accepted as a transfer student to Stanford University. And I would say that's a good sign that I'm not unteachable. <laughs> but Stanford knew I wasn't unteachable, but who else knew that? Sal Khan knew that. He knew that nobody is unteachable, and he reached out to help them. I wouldn't be standing on this stage if it wasn't for him, because he helped me by leading me to that epiphany. Upon graduating from Stanford with a degree in artificial intelligence, I worked in big tech, but I knew that I needed to still pay it forward more. So I quit my job and I joined ABC's Build program where I'm launching a company called TAP. It stands for Training All People, where I'm gonna help them learn vocational skills with technology. Because all people are teachable and all people deserve a chance. So, so, so Saul, thank you for what you've done because the world is better when education spreads and you have definitely improved the world and I thank you. Now I'm going to come over and hug you like a big softie. <laughs> My goodness, an amazing story, two amazing stories. But now it's time to begin the presentation of the 2022 Patrick J. McGovern Tech for Humanity Luminary Prize at CHM. And here to present the prize is someone with unique skills and awareness of the global impact of technologies of all kinds, a person who has built ships built companies and educational institutions. She is a serial entrepreneur, including the founder and CEO of VMware, and companies that were acquired by the likes of Google and Microsoft. She served as the CEO of Google Cloud and has been an active board member at companies, including Google, Intuit, SAP, Stripe, and is now the chair of the board of the MIT Corporation. And in her earlier life, was a world-class champion racer in windsurfing. And uh, she's also a naval architect. So here at CHM, we're particularly proud and grateful that she served on our Exponential Center Advisory Board, providing wonderful input and support for the museum. She's here with her husband, Wendell, tonight. So join me in welcoming Diane Green to the stage. an introduction. Um, but I'm really here to introduce Saul. Um, it's a just tremendous pleasure to introduce uh, you, Saul. Um, you know, all of us want to contrib contribute to the world in, in a positive way, and you always wonder, is it Im even possible for a single individual to make a real difference? And Sells an individual who has actually made a difference, just an enormous difference. He's a visionary, always looking forward, uh, immense intellect, a sonorous voice, and more charisma than seems possible for any one human being to have. And blackboard talents extraordinaire. <laughs> E.O. Wilson said that the trouble with humanity is that we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. 
Sal's made this somewhat less of a conundrum for humanity by making our schools less medieval and harnessing our technology so that it's accessible at no cost at all, including to untrained young children. He's reimagined education and made it accessible to nearly every young and old student around the globe, even if they're in jail, and in so doing has transformed our world. Democracy depends on education, and in today's knowledge and technology-driven societies, democracy does not depend on people just having basic literacy. Today, democracy depends on the possession of scientific literacy, on people being able to analyze issues critically from a data-driven perspective, and people being able to embrace living in a constantly changing world. Sal's science and math classes have reached hundreds of millions of students, and he got a lot of people through the COVID pandemic. He continues to innovate. I uh, see that, he, you know, with his online tutoring experimentation and development through Schoolhouse, and then partnering with some of the more innovative educational institutions, such as Arizona State University. The Khan Academy videos have been viewed approximately two billion times. To pr provide perspective, were these students all American, Sal so would have improved the scientific literacy of 100% of the students in the US many times over. I never forget the first time I watched a Sal Khan blackboard session. I was, it was early uh, 2010, I think, and I was just dazzled. I told everybody I could all about it. This is the future. And I finally found a mutual MIT friend, Hamant Tanisha, and he, he gave me an introduction. And I traipsed over to Castro Street and got to meet Saul. And uh, I remember I asked, how can I be helpful? And <laughs> I was thinking, I can, you know, maybe help the software engineering or something, and he said, oh, you could go give talks for me. And I'm like, no, that's, that's not it. Well, you're the talker. Um, but uh, eventually I did join his board, and it was a great privilege. Uh, another giant in contributing to our world, as we've all heard tonight, is Pat McGovern. I knew him through tech, through IDG, and uh, also through our shared roles on the MIT Corporation and all of his immense contributions there. So, so it's a, a really, really special privilege to call Saul up. of the Computer History Museum. I'm delighted to present to you the Patrick McGovern Tech for Humanity Prize, which is so well deserved. Oh, thank you so much. Well, um, what, what an what a amazing series of introductions, incredibly humbling on, on so many levels. Uh, I, I want to thank everyone that's been involved, uh, both with this and, and frankly, you know, I get disproportionate credit for uh, many things Khan Academy, but it's a lot of people around the world uh, who've now made this possible. Uh, but I, I want to start with just the McGovern Foundation and the McGovern family uh, for, for, for making this make possible. I'm, I'm more, more than honored. Uh, I want to thank I have board members here, Curtis and Diane. I want to thank the Computer History Museum. Daniel and I are always hatching up new schemes, how Mountain View can become the cultural center of the world. <laughs> We're going to get there. We're going to get there. Um, I, I want to you know, be clear that Khan Academy is much more than me now. Uh, we have over 200 employees around the world. Uh, we, have all of, we have hundreds of thousands of people who donate to Khan Academy. Uh, I think the number is 150 something thousand donors who donate on average 20, 30 dollars. Some, some large, some small corporations who make this possible. I remember, and many of y'all are sitting here, and, and you know, I remind everyone that we are at a, a special time in history where 
something that is the budget of a large high school, which is what our annual budget is, has the potential uh, to reach all of humanity um, in all walks of life, hopefully in most cases, can kind of raise the ceiling for students who already have access to schools, maybe many of our families, allow a world for more personalization, for people to actually fill in their gaps, and just learn that much more than, than you would have otherwise thought possible, uh, but also be a safety net for a world in which so many people aren't uh, being given access. And, you know, y'all heard from two of my favorite people and two of the stories, you know, Sultana and Jason, that I think in, anytime you do any job, and, and I feel very, very privileged uh, to have the job that I have and to get to work with the people I, I work with, but every now and then you have a meeting that you're like, okay, this isn't like how I wish I would sp spend my life. Uh, but I, I, I literally think of Sultana, I think of Jason, and I was like, wow, there's more Sultanas, there's more uh, Jasons around the world. You know, the, the least thing I can do is sit through this meeting in, in order, in order, in order, in order uh, to, to make that a reality. And, and I want to say, you know, we, we had that uh, session earlier uh, where I was interviewed uh, by um, two, two amazing interviewers, especially Anahita, who's a, a, a freshman at MIT. And I kept talking about this tension that we all feel between kind of big ideas, uh, maybe delusionally big ideas, free world-class education for anyone anywhere, and kind of the, you know, imposter syndrome we all sometimes feel like, oh, why me? Or, or you know, wh wh why, am, and why am I going to be the, the, the or at least part of uh, maybe stepping up to, to help solve this thing? And, um, you know, I, I, I just remind folks that it's, it's it, it, if, if we don't at least keep that tension and every now and then have some of those delusional st thoughts and, and at least take one step forward, uh, you just never know what's, what's possible. And so, you know, 10, 10, 15 years ago, thinking free world-class education for anyone, anywhere, felt like science fiction, it felt, like, it felt delusional, but 10, 15 years later, it feels actually that much more likely. It feels like it's actually within reach. So as much as, um, you know, there, there's a lot about the world that we need to worry about, I hope that all of y'all, and you know, looking at the other award recipients today, uh, gives me uh, tr tremendous, tremendous hope. Last but not least, I want to thank uh, some key members of this Khan Academy journey. You know, once again, I get disproportionate credit for all of this. There's so many other stakeholders. But in 2009, when I was like, oh, this is where I want to spend my time, and I was looking at our savings, I was not doing that alone. I was doing that with my wife. <laughs> And, and she's the one, and, and, and in a time that very few people believe that it was a good idea for a hedge fund analyst to quit his day job and start making YouTube videos and kind of homebrew software for his cousins as a nonprofit in Silicon Valley, I, I, I really want to thank my wife uh, and my family for putting up with my uh, crazy ideas um, over, over the years. So with that, you know, th Th thank you all. This is beyond humbling, um, but I'm so happy to be part of the computer history uh, family. Thank you. Thank you. He let the secret out. We are conspiring about Mountain View becoming the center, the cultural center of Silicon Valley. We do have seven and a half acres of land here, if anybody. It's not unreasonable to think about it. Congratulations, all. Uh, among others, I want to congratulate you on receiving this wonderful award this evening. As we close, uh, I'd like to just express my gratitude to each of the remarkable participants in the program today, as well as the staff and crew that put the program together. So if you'd join me in thanking all of them, I'd appreciate it. And cl clearly our, our change maker, Mercy, and your dynamic work um, and sort of the vibrancy with which you bring things to life and the good things that you're doing for the healthcare system. Michael, your energy and initiative to help um, really think more deeply about what we're doing with these systems and to bring that to the fore and make it available to the public for a level of inspection and and integration into real life products that affect real people every day. So thank you for that. We're inspired by that. And obviously, I'd like to thank the Patrick May J. McGovern Foundation team, the leaders in the community for being a supporter and partner in this program. Um, the conversation started some years ago with Marguerite and Patrick 
Uh, and uh, tonight is a wonderful culmination of the partnership and the presentation of this award on behalf of, of Pat uh, McGovern Sr., whom I met personally long ago, like many who've said uh, that um, this evening. And, um, you know, it was, he was a rare individual with an incredible, I'd say, quest for life and commitment to individual achievement, uh, as well as sort of the collective education uh, of the world um, and the implications of the technology that was springing forth from the Boston community back then and kind of found its center of gravity here in Silicon Valley, but uh, it's now a state of mind that exists around the world as a result of the IDG Corporation and his global work. Um, you know, he hired indigenous local people in every country uh, and, and uh, you know, worked for the greater good and I'm a proud reader of the dummies books myself, so <laughs> thank you for that. Um, this is an opportunity uh, for us to all raise the banner of hope uh, and to look through the lens of the computing past and how it informs the digital present, uh, the inspiration that drove the inventors and those of the past, in many ways all spring forth from the great demonstration of all time that was done in 1968 by by Engelbart, the mother of all demos, and uh, the inspiration was the motivation of solving world-level problems that we have created for ourselves. Um, and we didn't necessarily think it was gonna turn out like this, so we've got extra work uh, to do, uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here at the museum uh, personally over the last four years. I've had two uh, to begin cranking up the engine and two to work under the shroud of COVID. Uh, but as we come out of this pandemic, um, the gathering tonight, I think, is a representative sense of community, uh, those who care and who can contribute and help make a difference in the world. So thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. We appreciate your support. And again, thanks to the McGovern Foundation for all of their generous support for this program. Thank you.